Good morning. Welcome, and to those of you who were here yesterday, last night, um, welcome back to the conference on U.S.-China rivalry. We have an amazing program for you today. Um, we're all really excited to hear our speakers. And to start us off on this first full day of the conference, I would like to invite our president, Dr. Joanne Roberts, on stage to give us a welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It is absolutely thrilling to see so many of you here, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this conference on one of the most crucial themes of geopolitics today, the rivalry between the US and China. We're particularly pleased to organize this in conjunction with our close and intellectually formidable um, partners from our founding institutions, the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy here at NUS, and the Jackson School of Global Affairs at Yale. Since our inception, the college has aspired to be a place where ideas and perspectives from East and West meet, while being firmly embedded here in Singapore and here in Southeast Asia. This conference is a perfect example of that. Southeast Asia is a key player in the great power competition between the US and China. While seeking to avoid confrontation with both, Countries in the region are deeply invested with each. China is the largest trading partner for most, and the US maintains strategic and cooperative security relations with many. Understanding how the nations of Southeast Asia approach issues of cooperation and collaboration with China and the US is essential to gain a nuanced and more complete view of how this rivalry will play out. We have convened an impressive group of scholars for the next few days, scholars and practitioners from the region and the West. Our hope for this conference is twofold. First, we aim to enrich the understanding of great power relations by centering the conversation here on Southeast Asia, bringing a necessary perspective that's often missed with a singular focus on China and the US. Second, we view this collaboration with scholars in the region as a starting point. We're excited to act as a catalyst for stronger ties across the region and beyond between academics and institutions. In putting together this conference, I'm grateful to many people. First, from our institutional partners, I'd like to thank my good friend Danny Kwa, Dean, and Lee Kasheng, Professor in Economics at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, and Jim Levinson, the founding dean and Charles W. Goodyear Professor in Global Affairs at the Jackson School. Also, I want to recognize the other members of the program committee who are responsible for the stellar lineup, and they are Selena Ho from LKY, Arnie Westad and Ted Wittenstein from Jackson, and my colleagues, Chin Hao Huang and Trisha Craig here at the college. And to put together an event like this, it takes a village and we have a great one here in our events team, led by Ali with Cole, Freya, and Adeline, our tech and venue group, Eddie, Wayne, and Gurjeet, and all of the wonderful student associates who have been helping you um, over the last day. They deserve all of our thanks. My deepest gratitude, however, goes to Ms. Chu Get Kim, Executive Chairman of the Straits, uh, the Straits Trading Company and Deputy Chairman of the Ten Shin Chuan Foundation. The foundation is not only supporting the conference, but has been a steadfast champion of the college since the beginning. It's Get Kim's vision of the important role of Singapore in providing a neutral space for reflection and analysis on current geopolitical realities that inspired our multi-year series on geopolitics, of which this conference is an important part. So let me say an enormous thank you to her and invite Ms. Chu to the podium to offer some remarks. Get Kim, please. Thank you, Professor Roberts, for your very kind introduction and for your kind words. And I'm very happy to see the a result of our discussions and the plan that we had uh, uh, first forged when we discussed the possibility of arranging 
um, this session. So for almost 50 years, the Tan Jin Tuan Foundation has been privileged to contribute to the development of Singapore. We support programs in community building, the arts and education, but our focus is not just Singapore. We are also deeply involved in the region whose development and fortunes are inextricably tied to our own. As a foundation, our guiding principle is to ensure that the outcomes of what we do benefit the greatest number possible. We work with organizations on projects and programs that have a cascading or multiplier effect in order to achieve that. In that spirit, we are delighted to support this conference. It brings together three preeminent institutions, Yale and US College, the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, and the Jackson School. Their complementary strengths, networks, and paths of convocation allow them to disseminate widely critical and insightful perspectives in the region. Here in Southeast Asia, we are witness to the growing rivalry between the two great powers of the day, China and the US. But we are not just passive observers. Singapore and its neighbors strive to maintain good relations and share a nuanced view of the perspectives of each, allowing the region to act as a buffer. Yale and US is an institution that convenes perspectives and viewpoints from both East and West. This conference is well placed to consider the foreign policy drivers of states in the region as they navigate, navigate complex geopolitical realities of living in the shadow of US-China rivalry. Importantly, through the power of the networks assembled here, we hope to share these insights widely, particularly across diverse geographies, and in so doing, multiply their impact and influence. We at the Tan Chin Tuan Foundation wish the participants and panelists a productive and rewarding conference. We look forward to strengthening of ties across the region and beyond, and to a deeper understanding of the central geopolitical relationships of our age. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Chu, for your words. Now, I am delighted to welcome Professor Kung Yuan Fung back to the stage here at the Performance Hall at Yale and US. Prof Kong, who is a Lee Ka Shing Professor of Political Science at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, is an analyst of global affairs whose expansive knowledge of both US foreign policy and Asia's international relations makes him one of the most insightful interpreters of the relationship between the two regions. He began his academic career at Harvard, where he received his PhD, as an associate professor in the Department of Government. From there, he moved to Nuffield College at Oxford before coming here to Singapore. Prof Kong has made significant contributions to the field of political psychology, and his book, Analogies at War, Korea, Munich, Dien Bien Phu, and the Vietnamese Decisions of 1965 have been, has been highly lauded. And as someone who's had multiple perches, in the US, in Europe, and here in Asia to view the making of foreign policy and who has focused on the historical analogies that policymakers use to guide and justify their decisions, for example, the Cold War or the Peloponnesian War. These are two that are, of course, relevant to our discussion today. He's uniquely poised to analyze the current state of affairs between China and the US. I know that we are all in for a real treat as we hear his, um, his remarks today, and I am happy to invite Prof Kong up to the stage. Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. Now, now, for this morning's keynote, I thought I'll take a step back from the domestic politics of the ASEAN 10 and take stock of the so-called larger picture of what seems to be behind all this pressure to choose. So I would like to address a rather basic question. What is the China-US contest today about? It's not unlike Ryan's first question yesterday, those of you who were here, with his finger on the Washington pulse, and in the most riveting and balanced way, he addressed that question as one of his three yesterday. My account, I'm afraid, will be a bit more academic. Uh, with my fingers on the uh, so-called paradigmatic pulse, but I hope you'll find it interesting nevertheless. Uh, now, in my view, there's no consensus among those of us who study international relations on the answer to what is the nature of the conflict. The answer that most of us would have encountered is that we are caught in an era of great power competition. But that competition can take many forms with different implications. For today, I shall focus on the two dominant paradigms that IR scholars have relied on to describe and explain the US-China competition. The security dilemma, let's call it SD, and the power transition paradigm, let's call it PT. Now, as this slide suggests, some of the most prominent IR scholars have privileged SD, others have used PT, and still others have mixed or conflated the two in their analysis of US-China interactions. What do I mean by the paradigm? What I basically mean is that uh, it's a framework that contains the basic assumptions and insights that inform a scientific community's understanding of a problem or phenomenon. If you prefer, uh, you can think of a paradigm as a theory or a perspective. So the question I want to ask this morning is, which paradigm accords better with the trajectory of China-US interactions in the last 10, 20 years? So that's the question I'll try to answer. And I might as well let the cat out of the bag uh, now. I shall argue that US-China interactions in the last decade especially hews closer to PT than it does to SD dynamics. I'll begin by saying something about the two perspectives, after which I will uh, tease out their observable implications. By their observable implications, I mean, what kind of behaviours should we be seeing if a SD is at work? And what kind of behaviours should we be witnessing if PT is at work? So after laying out their different observable implications, I'll try to assess which framework does a better job in describing US-China interactions in the last decade or so. And I'll conclude by addressing the so what question. So what if it's SD? So what if it's PT? Now, I should confess that the account of US-China relations that I'll be sharing with you tends to be from the vantage point of the US, in part because I'm a student of US foreign policy, and in part because the US side is easier to document, given the availability of policy documents uh, put out by each administration. Now, from the vantage point of the US, but that doesn't mean that I necessarily agree with that point of view. I like to think that as an analyst, I'm aloof from either the US or China's point of view. My focus is on telling the story of their interactions and not on whose point of view is more correct. Okay, all right. Um, let's come to SD now. One of the first things that students of international relations are exposed to is uh, SD. My friend Steve Walt at the uh, Harvard Kennedy School says if you have taken an introductory IR course and have not encountered the security dilemma, you should be asking for your money back. Uh, now, SD begins with the assumption that the international or regional system uh, in which states find themselves is anarchic, i.e. it is a system without formal governmental authority above the states, unlike us in society, in domestic society. Given this anarchic environment, 
And given that states cannot be certain of the intentions of others, whether neighbors or faraway powers, they must fend for themselves. Fend for themselves usually means striving for military security by arming, uh, increase your defense spending, build or acquire planes, ships, and other military hardware, join alliances. So in the SD framework, and this is crucial, your intentions in arming are benign, or at least they are not malign, as far as you are concerned. The aim is simply to ensure your own security so that you, are, you have what it takes to protect your political sovereignty and territorial integrity. The trouble or dilemma is that as you arm, unintentionally, you frighten others. The f they fear your increasing military power. They see it as threatening to their own security. So they also try to fend for themselves by counter-arming, which in turn causes you to counter-counter-arm, thus setting off a competitive armament spiral. This arm spiral leads to increasing tensions as well as the possibility of war. What makes the security dilemma a dilemma is that the situation faced by the two sides. Each is seeking security, but as one arms and the other side reacts, the whole cycle makes both less secure. What makes the situation tragic is that neither intended to set off the spiral of arming and counter-arming. So that's the SD, and people have applied it uh, to uh, look at uh, the US-China US -China relations and even uh, the Ukraine conflict. Now, the second framework, PT, uh, is something that most of us here would have heard of in one guise or another in recent years. In many introductory IR courses in the West, undergraduates are assigned to see this, the Peloponnesian War, the key takeaway of which uh, is, as a point number one here, to see this observation that what caused the war was the rise of Athens and the fear it caused in Sparta. The narrative revolves around a rising power that is perceived to be threatening by the established power and how that generates a logic of strategic competition with each side pressuring others to align with them, sounds familiar, and the resulting military crisis that can often lead to war. This is the essence of the PT logic. Now, this view has been given a 21st century sheen by Graham Allison as the Thucydides trap, in which he warns the US and China from falling behind, uh, falling into. For Allison, China has risen to a point where it is poised to challenge the US as the global hegemon. As the Lowy Institute Asia Power Index here suggests, probably the best out there in measuring Asian power, uh, China is at 90% of the US's comprehensive power in Asia. Now, power transition theorists say that when the rising power starts to get, uh, at that stage, uh, the rising power starts to get more demanding and agitate for change. And this normally happens at around 80% of the hegemon strength. The implication here is that China has crossed that threshold maybe, you know, seven, eight years ago. So Ellison went back to history to figure out what happens when such a dynamic is in play. And he finds that in 16 of the cases he investigated, 12 ended up in a power transition war. And his purpose in writing the book is to warn China and the US, be like the other four that did not end up in a hegemonic war, don't fall into Thucydides' trap, like the other 12 or the, the other 75%. Ellison's interpretation of Thucydides has been criticized by some historians, but even if we take away Thucydides from his analysis, I believe his PT-based perspective uh, merits attention. Ellison, for example, placed great stock in the views of the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, whom he described as unquestionably the world's premier China watcher, unquote. And back in 2011, 
he posed this question to Mr. Lee. Uh, does China seek to displace the US as number one in Asia or the world? And this is Mr. Lee's reply. Of course, why not? And you can read it here. And we can discuss this a little bit at Q&A if you like. But for now, I should just mention that Mr. Lee's take was yes, China's long-term goal is to displace the US. Anyone with China's talent, power, uh, you know, uh, scale, scope would. But for now, what China wants is co-equality. So, um, we need to bear that in mind. Okay. Now, uh, but even before Ellison and uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, there was Paul, Ken Paul Kennedy, one of Yale's most distinguished historians, whose 1987 book, The Rise and Fall of Great Powers, was an international bestseller. Kennedy's 600-page tome sought to order five centuries of European international history in terms of how one power rises to become the dominant power and how over time it would be challenged by an upstart or rising power who might or might not displace it, but usually through war. Uh, Kennedy paid special attention to the relationship between economic resources and strategic commitments, and he warned against what he called imperial overstretch, which would make the established power vulnerable to challenges posed by the rising power. His account is more nuanced than those by political scientists uh, such as Ellison and Organsky, but I don't think he'll disagree with them about the main assumptions of the PT approach, which I want to uh, get into a little bit now. Uh, as you might have guessed, to begin with, uh, the PT perspective is much more concerned about hierarchy. The world might be anarchic, but there still exists a pecking order which concerns states. There is such a thing as an identifiable, predominant economic military power at a given point in time or historical period, uh, or a hegemon whose leadership is accepted by the relevant others. Over time, however, because of differential economic growth, another power will rise to challenge the hegemon. This is over, you know, maybe hundreds of years, uh, you know, many decades, uh, because uh, the rising power wants to be the number one. The rising power is certain about its long-term objective to displace the current hegemon. And the current hegemon is also certain about the intentions of the rising power to challenge it in the short term and to displace it in the long term. So there isn't the kind of uncertainty about the other fellow's intentions as in SD. That's a contrast. But the result of this struggle for position in the hierarchy is quite similar, however, to SD because in both situations, the great powers engage in competitive arming in a cycle. The rising power arms to obtain the military power to challenge and displace the established power, right? while the established power arms to maintain its lead. And this is the main reason why IR scholars have found it very hard to distinguish between SD and PT, uh, and they have tended to conflate them, because the outcomes of the two uh, logics are broadly similar. Competitive arming with the possibility of conflict. Okay, so if we cannot distinguish between the two logics by looking at outcomes, i.e. their competitive arming, where should we look? I suggest that we look at the way they talk and act, the policies that they design in their journey toward competitive arming. So in SD situations, I suggest, we should expect talk, what a uh, diplomatic discourse, and behavior that, number one, do not emphasize hierarchy, are premised on uncertainty about the intentions of the other side, are watchful of unintended consequences, uh, and in line with uh, uh, that, uh, can reassure the other side about one's benign intentions. And finally, that focuses on uh, addressing the military challenge. PT talk and behavior, on the other hand, I suggest, emphasize hierarchy, uh, 
are premised on greater certainty about the intentions of the other side, is rather indifferent to unintended consequences. Uh, and it's indifferent to reassuring the other side. And it goes beyond the military dimension in seeing the need of a multi-dimensional approach to the challenge. So this is how I plan to go about trying to distinguish between SD and PT. In what follows, I will give a survey of some of the key moments of the milestones in US-China relations and assess if they fit better with SD or PT dynamics. Now, this is an interpretation on my part. I will doubtless uh, miss some key moments probably miscategorize a few, but I hope, having shared with you uh, the criteria for recognizing SD and PT, my interpretation comes across as plausible. It's also quite uh, 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 scary to be saying this because uh, we have in our audience uh, friends uh, who have actually helped, uh, you know, concord policies uh, during the administrations I'm talking about. So, uh, but anyway, I'll try. So what we are interested in is examining China-US interactions to see which of the two paradigms help us understand those interactions better. And I'll begin with a few thoughts on the 1980s and 1990s. As the Cold War was winding down and it was clear that the Soviet Union was a spent force, US strategists began to worry about Japan. Japan's economic prowess seemed very formidable. Remember, Ezra Vogel put it in his bestseller, Japan, as number one. Right? And while it was a US military ally, there remained worries about Japan becoming a strategic competitor in the long term. Uh, I was working in the US then, and there was talk about whether the US needed to contain Japan. Uh, all these worries disappeared, however, with the bursting of the Japanese economic bubble in the 1990s. Second, the Tiananmen incident of 1989 did jolt many in the US. It led to questions about China's external demeanor. Could it be a responsible great power if it treated its own citizens so violently? Would it be equally aggressive externally? Although the George H.W. Bush administration criticized China publicly uh, on the incident, uh, it did send uh, NSC advisor Brent Scowcroft quietly uh, to reassure the Chinese that the two sides could still work together, especially as tacit allies encountering the Soviet Union. But Tiananmen would not be forgotten, especially when considered in conjunction with China's continued impressive economic growth uh, in subsequent years. 15 years of 10% GDP growth uh, in the mid-1990s U.S. strategists began worrying about China. And that's when the debate about whether the U.S. should engage or contain China began. Articles like The Coming War with China began to permeate the pages of journals like uh, magazines like Foreign Affairs. In this debate, uh, in the mid-1990s, I believe the engagers won. Buttressed by the advice from the likes of the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, who was among the most vocal and articulate on not going down the containment path. US's, US businesses eyeing China as a market and manufacturing center also chimed in in favor of engagement. Moreover, the US needed a respite from the rigors of the previous Cold War, so it was enjoying the peace dividend. It, perhaps even more crucial, was a theory held by many in the US foreign policy establishment about the relationship between capitalist economic growth and liberal democracy. The idea was that when autocratic countries like China are successfully integrated into the global economy, Western-led economy, when they have achieved strong economic growth, say like the East Asian Tigers or the Four Little Dragons before China, they would also become more politically liberal. Over time, the figure of uh, uh, US $10,000 uh, per capita was mentioned by some studies by political scientists. Over time, when China, like those before it, when it reaches that kind of per capita income, it will stand a good chance of becoming uh, more liberal politically. Uh, 
Later, I will also suggest that it is the bursting of this theoretical bubble, especially during the Trump years, that gives us the clearest indication that the US has transited to PT dynamics, the US-China interaction. The third event that needs to be mentioned is the Straits Crisis of 1995-96, when Taiwanese President Li Tenghui was granted a visa to visit his alma mater, Cornell, which the Clinton administration actually did not approve, but which Congress overrode. Uh, China showed its displeasure by lobbing missiles, not unlike what it did during the Pelosi visit last year, uh, close to Taiwan. The US responded by dispatching two aircraft carriers to traverse the straits in a show of its power projection capabilities. Now, whether China stopped its stable rattling because of this, uh, it's less of an issue for my topic this morning. The more germane point is that it showed China how militarily weak and far behind the US it was, and the need to catch up. And during the Iraq war of 1990-91, the superiority of US technology, those cruise missiles capable of hitting targeted buildings with pinpoint accuracy, uh, had already jolted Chinese officials, uh, but the Straits crisis hit much nearer to home. Those who point to China's development of anti-ship ballistic missiles capable of taking out aircraft carriers and how that might change the US calculus in terms of power projection in uh, Northeast Asia usually point to the mid-1990s Straits Crisis as the catalytic event that spurred China to develop asymmetrical strategies like those missiles uh, and to begin building its own uh, naval power. But for this period, the 19, late 1980s to the late 1990s, the PT logic is not very relevant because China was neither economically or militarily powerful enough to be thought of by itself or the US as a challenger. Now, what about SD logic? I would say that some SD features seem to be present. There was uncertainty about the intentions of the other. Uh, both sides worried about unintended consequences of their actions. Uh, for example, uh, US apology over the Belgrade bombing of the Chinese embassy. And there was probably some reactive arming. Uh, some of the observable implications of SD were present then. But the situation, I would argue, did not develop into an SD spiral because engagement and integration of China into the US-led world economy continued apace. Uh, I should note that my task this morning is to discover if and when PT dynamics began to operate. Now, whether it was preceded by SD doesn't really impinge on my argument, it would be neat, it would be nice if I could show that it was SD at one point and how that morphed into PT later, but I don't think that is necessary for my story. Whatever it was before uh, PT, I think it shouldn't affect the claim, my claim about you know, how it became PT. So that brings me to the 21st century. China's joining the WTO in 2001 provides strong evidence that at that time, the US had yet to perceive China as a peer competitor with malign interests, with malign intentions. If the US had thought of China as a peer competitor then, it could have prevented China's accession to the organization. The US drove a hard bargain in November 1999 when China and the US signed the agreement. Right? An interesting question, I think, would be, if the US had a crystal ball that told it that in 1999, China's joining the WTO would facilitate its economy, overtaking the US economy in GDP, PPP terms 15 years later, would the US have signed the accession agreement? Back then, the US was still enjoying its unipolar and leader of the free world moment, savoring the peace uh, dividend. March 2001 is another significant date, this time in favour of the PT uh, perspective because of an incident that signalled rise, China's rising, rising China's impatience with high-altitude US spying around sensitive areas. No, the US wasn't using balloons, 
It was using the Super Duper EP3 spy plane uh, with a crew of 24 flying in international airspace but close to Hainan Island in the South China Sea. At any rate, two Chinese J-8 interceptors were sent out to accost and to tail the EP-3. One of them collided with the EP-3, resulting in the death of a Chinese pilot and the emergency landing of the damaged EP-3 on Hainan Island. The EP-3 crew was detained for 11 days and were released only after US, the US issued an apology of sorts. Later, the EP plane was dismantled created and returned to the US in July. Now, um, this may be seen as the first diplomatic military salvo on China's part, telling the US that we don't like what you're doing here. And China can only show this kind of displeasure because after 20 years of impressive economic growth and increasing and increased military spending, it's beginning to have some of the hardware that allows it to say no. The US certainly noticed, and the incident strained relations for a while. Six months later, however, on September 11, 2001, Al-Qaeda struck New York and the Pentagon and took US eyes off China for the next 10, 15 years. In response to 9-11, the George W. Bush administration launched two wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq and put China or rather uh, China on the uh, back burner. Right. Or rather, it also needed China's ex assistance in the global war against terror. The focus was on the Middle East, not Asia, uh, as ASEAN countries found to their chagrin. Top US officials missed several ASEAN meetings. However, the Bush administration did beef up Asian alliances, and that is important. It shows that despite having to devote maximal attention to the Middle East, there was some awareness of China's rising power and influence. George uh, W. Bush, for example, uh, uh, had his National Security Council actually um, bequeath a handover tome uh, on his strategy, on his China's on his strategy for the incoming Obama administration. And the author of the China chapter, Paul Henley, is actually here today. Uh, this is the book, uh, Handoff, and Paul, thanks to you, we get an invaluable glimpse of the administration's accomplishments, extracts of which can be seen in this slide. And Paul even uh, was so graceful to bring me a hard copy of the book when I told him that when, the moment I saw that the book was out, I got a Kindle version, all right, which is what you see in the picture. Uh, now, the point I want to make uh, here is that the administration's assessment uh, is consistent with SD dynamics. Uh, point one says the US still sees China more as a partner than an adversary. So no malign intentions. Point two, yes, the US is uncertain about China's future intentions or strategy. So we need to, so the US needs to hedge by transforming its military capabilities and beefing up its alliances. So the SD counter arming logic seems to be somewhat in play here. Point three, by 2008, uh, the US had growing concerns about China's future trajectory because uh, its economic development has not been accompanied by greater political openness. Well, we'll let you, the Obama administration, deal with it. All right. Um, and I think the Obama administration uh, did deal with it in its own contemplative and deliberative way but it stopped short of casting China as a strategic adversary. So the 2015 uh, NSS, that is uh, by the uh, Bush W. Bush administration, continued to welcome the rise of a stable, peaceful, and prosperous China, and argued for that the scope of cooperation was unprecedented. Now, it did say that the US remained alert to China's military modernization and reject intimidation in resolving territorial disputes, read South and East China Sea. Uh, but there is little hint in this document that the US was viewing China as a systemic uh, challenger. I'm sorry, uh, what I meant was the, this is the 2017 uh, NSS, the Obama NSS. Uh, yet the centerpiece of Obama's approach was of course the pivot 
or the rebalancing to Asia, interestingly mentioned only twice in the 2017 document. At first glance, the pivot comes across as a very sensible recalibration of US strategy after a decade of extreme focus on the Middle East. Insofar as the world's center of economic gravity uh, is shifting east, it's only natural that the US would want to reapportion more of its military might in that direction. But the pivot to Asia probably convinced China that the US was out to constrain its rise. This was the time when you begin to hear more Chinese talk about the US wanting to contain it. Xi Jinping's new model of great power relations, sort of a G2 condominium for Asia, did not get very far with the Obama administration. The US was not ready or willing to recognize China as a co-equal in Asia yet. In her memoirs, Hillary Clinton recounted Chinese foreign policy chief Honcho Daibingguo's response to her explanation of the US pivot to Asia. So uh, Dai's retort was, why don't you pivot out of here? All right, now, uh, that speaks volumes about the Chinese view, the assumption that the US does not belong in Asia. As when Xi Jinping opined back as far back as uh, 2013, security in Asia should be maintained by Asians themselves. Some have suggested that China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative, announced by Xi in uh, in 2013, may be seen as a response to the US pivot to Asia. Encircled by the US and its allies in the Western Pacific, Chinese strategists searched for strategic space westwards and found it in the BRI. Even without the pivot on the part of the US, I believe China would have rediscovered the Silk Route and leveraged on its economic and industrial strength as well as excess economic capacity to engage and influence those along the route. It could also be a more potent source of Chinese soft power than the Confucius Institutes. Then, of course, you also have the RCEP, conceived in 2011, realized minus India in 2020, the AIIB in 2013, the BRICS New Development Bank in 2014, not to mention making significant diplomatic inroads in Central Asia, Africa, Latin America, and even the Middle East. These are Chinese uh, diplomatic economic efforts. So this is a China parlaying its economic and financial resources to assume a leadership role in setting up alternative institutions to the US and Western-led ones, such as the IMF, the World Bank, or the TPP while it lasted. And of course, they all excluded the US. The US response to the advent of the, I, to the AIIB, China's uh, B, BRI, and its own take on the TPP, which was the only major US-led regional initiative uh, you know, for a long time. Uh, however, I think it does reveal US concerns about the expansion of Chinese power and influence. It was the Obama administration that warned Britain against joining the AIIB. So when the UK rebuffed the US and joined as a founding member, thus opening the floodgates for the other EU members to join, Obama's officials described the British choice as being rather accommodating to China and just sort of one step short of appeasement. Now, President Obama also did not mince his words when it came to why the TPP was important. It was to prevent China from making the rules of the international economic game. That prerogative should be the monopoly of the US, not to be shared with rising powers such as China until they prove themselves to be responsible. Now, similarly, the US saw the BRI as an economic strategic threat, criticizing it, criticizing its debt trap diplomacy and countering it by working with allies such as Japan and India to come up with alternative high-quality infrastructure schemes for developing countries. So as these remarks by President Obama suggest, there seems to be greater US concern that China may pose a systemic challenge to the US and the US-led world order. Despite that, I think uh, there were two ideas that prevented Obama 
from reaching the tipping point of seeing China as a systemic threat during his administration. First, his confidence in America's power and values, very unmaga compared to his successor, and the expectation that at some point, a prosperous China may change its political complexion in the liberal direction and thus quell the US's strategic unease. Oh, let me see. Okay. So, while China may be moving in the direction of viewing US intentions as malign because uh, of the pivot, uh, the Obama administration was more sanguine about China's intentions. Not that malign yet. And in terms of our two paradigms, I would say that during the W. Bush and Obama years, the PT dynamics had yet to operate in an obvious way. What about the SD dynamic? Some of the observable implications of SD were present. Uncertainty about Chinese intentions on the US, US side. Uh, there was still willingness to reassure. And so overall, my take is that the emphasis remained on cooperation and engagement rather than a tit-for-tat military competition. In that sense, the SD dynamic was also largely absent. That brings me um, to the Trump years. Okay. Uh, in August 2018, President Trump said, uh, when I came in, we were heading in a direction that was going to allow China to be bigger than us in a very short time. That ain't going to happen anymore. So Trump wants the US to remain the biggest power uh, of all time. China's economy, in PPP terms, had already overtaken that of the US. But what Trump seems to be saying is that he wants to prevent China from becoming even bigger, especially on nominal exchange rate terms uh, in the coming years. His administration seems particularly concerned about Made in China 2025, where China aspires to be self-sufficient and perhaps even dominant in artificial intelligence, robotics, supercomputing, and so on. The US fear was that if China were ahead in these game-changing technologies of the 21st century, it would alter the political military balance. Whoever dominates the technological knowledge frontier would have a big advantage in becoming the hegemon and the US wants to ensure that you know, uh, it, not China, will continue to be that hegemon. This interest in maintaining US hegemony, I think seems clear in the Trump administration's America First National Security Strategy document, the 2017 document. The uh, document is emphatic about the need to maintain US military overmatch vis-a-vis -vis its adversaries and in maintaining what it calls the favorable balance of power uh, in favor of the US. The document identifies China and Russia as the two revisionist powers engaged in a fundamental political contest with the US. And according to the uh, Trump NSS, our task is to ensure that American military superiority endures, as well as to advance American influence because the world that supports American interests and reflects our values makes, American, makes America more secure and prosperous. Now, replacing the Asia-Pacific with the Indo-Pacific, the NSS singles out China as the power that seeks to displace the US in the Indo-Pacific region. So what Graham Ellison worried about in the early 2010s when he asked the late Mr. Lee about does China want to displace the US was answered in the affirmative by the Trump administration in 2017. Previous administrations might have pondered about the possibility, but they did not articulate it explicitly in their analysis. And I think what led Trump, what led the, administ what led the Trump administration to do the displacement conclusion is twofold. By the late 2010s, China's comprehensive power in Asia seems to be approaching that of the US, as the earlier Lowy slide uh, shows. Second, and perhaps more importantly, the Trump administration made a critical judgment call. The long-standing assumption about how China would liberalize as it was integrated into the US-led global economic system 
has been proven wrong. China will remain authoritarian, and now the US faces a competitor bent on shaping a world antithetical to US values and interests. If the Chinese concluded during the Obama years that the US long-term intentions were not so friendly, we could say that the US concluded the same about Chinese intentions during the Trump years. You might remember speeches by Vice President Mike Pence uh, at the Hudson Institute and by Secretary of State Mike Pompeo uh, in the Nixon Library calling out China uh, you know, uh, and its misdeeds. So perceptions of malign intentions on both sides means that it is not SD. Doesn't necessarily mean it is PT, but when you add the long-term struggle for hierarchic position, I think it brings us closer to the view that the PT dynamic is beginning to operate. The strategic assessments expressed in the NSS help explain the Trump administration's policies toward China, of which the escalating trade war was just the most uh, obvious manifestation. Okay. Now, those, um, those who hoped that the Biden administration would tamp down the trade war, I think have been disappointed. The Biden administration's NSS, uh, the, one, the blue one, using more moderate language, arrives at the same conclusions about Chinese intentions. China is the long-term challenger capable and desirous of displacing the US as the hegemon in Asia, if not globally. As US Indo-Pacific commander Aquilino said in Singapore last week, the US is here to prevent a certain revisionist power, uh, read China, from seeking to disrupt and displace the current system in ways that benefit itself at the expense of others, unquote. In the US mind, there's no longer uncertainty about Chinese intentions. And as the current hegemon, usually left unstated, uh, the US is pushing back big time. The main difference between Biden and Trump on how to meet the China challenge is on the handling of allies. The tough love or disdain that Trump had for allies uh, has been replaced by a more tender and loving and I would say successful approach in con corralling allies to meet uh, the short-term challenge of Russia and the long-term challenge of China. From China's perspective, the Biden administration must come across as strategically more formidable and therefore more threatening than Trump precisely because the Biden strategy is more coherent with the administration very adept at working with allies in ways that Trump was dismal at. On the China challenge, think of the administration's initiatives, what I call the full spectrum competition associated with PT, the last point, uh, like strengthening the Quad, the AUKUS deal just formalized last week, and bringing together like-minded coalition to counter Chinese military power and political influence. And on the technological front, ensuring that Huawei is cut out of 5G provision for the US and its allies, the Chips and Science Act, the in-progress Chips for Alliance, and the potential ban on TikTok, all of which are meant to retard China's technological advancement on the semiconductors front, technological front, which are necessary for advanced weaponry, robotics, and so on. As I've tried to suggest earlier, if China was disappointed by the Obama and Trump uh, interest in preserving US primacy in Asia, it must be alarmed by the policies of the Biden administration. Those of us who have followed China-US relations in the last few years would have observed China's more defiant and angry responses. The importance of hierarchy, more specifically China's dissatisfaction with US hegemony, I think can be seen in China's increasingly shrill protests against what it calls hegemonism. By now, I think there's enough certainty about US intentions that Xi Jinping at the recent National People's Congress identified the US as the leader of a Western coalition implementing the all-round containment and encirclement of China. Wang Yi and uh, Yang Jiazhe 
responded to Anthony Blinken and Jake Sullivan's opening remarks at the Anchorage Summit antagonistically instead of reassuringly, you know, uh, as when they say that, you know, the US had no right to speak to China from a position of strength. The unspoken warning here is that China is also strong and not to be trifled with. Neither did China bother to take Austin Lloyd's call over the balloon incident. Nothing to reassure the US about, since the US already shot the balloon down. China has also been reluctant to touch base with US Indo-Pacific Command to set up guardrails to prevent accidents or unintended consequences at sea in ways that Ryan talked about yesterday. And in the last decade, China's competition with the US has gone beyond the military. The BRI entails economics as well as the soft power. And, a, and of course, Made in China 2025 is about technological mastery and self-sufficiency in the key technological areas. In short, it is a full spectrum challenge. As, although, as we have seen, the US response to China is also likely to set back China's advancements in these areas. Let me conclude now. The portrait I've painted of US-China relations in the last decade uh, is just one that is morphing into PT dynamics. Lots of hierarchy talk, actions and counteractions consistent with wanting to maintain one's pole position or wanting to displace the one in pole position, increasing certainty about mutual sinister intentions on both sides, a rather blasé attitude toward reassuring the other. Nothing much to reassure if there's clarity about intentions, right? And an increasingly full spectrum or whole of society competition involving economics, military, technology, culture, and soft power. These are the observable implications, in my view, that fit the PT perspective better than the SD uh, perspective. Now, why does it matter whether it is PT or ST? To my mind, it matters in two ways. First, it matters to the field of international relations because we have not been very good at distinguishing between the two paradigms. This has meant that sometimes we have misapplied or conflated them in interpreting the real world. My attempt at clarifying what they involve is preliminary and more work needs to be done, but the hope that the hope is that they'll go some way in giving us a better appreciation of which paradigm is better suited to making sense of the underlying logic of the most important bilateral interstate relations of our time. Second, it matters in terms of policy, or more specifically, the severity of the policy challenge. SD dynamics in theory are easier to mitigate and to reverse because if the intentions of both sides are not malign, as the SD paradigm assumes, and if hierarchy is not all that consuming, then there's more room for diplomacy to reassure, to mitigate distrust through confidence-building mechanisms, to correct misperceptions, and to anticipate unintended consequences, all of which should work to decrease the chances of military conflict. PD dynamics, in contrast, suggest that the good intentions and skills of diplomats may not be enough because there's a fundamental conflict of interest at the broadest level. It's not just about Taiwan, the South China Sea, BRI, AUKUS, the Quad, or the IPEF. All those issues, flashpoints, and institutions are tied to the contest for long-term hegemony in Asia and beyond. There can only be one number one, and that's the crux of the problem. I think I'll stop there. Well, wow, thank you for that um, masterful account of the progression of U.S.-China rivalry and a framework for it.
Um, so we now have time for questions. Um, what I will um, what I will ask all of you is to uh, to raise your hand. Um, we have our uh, student associates who will pass around mics. Uh, and for those of you who are joining us online. JJ, one of our um, terrific global affairs students, is moderating questions online, and we'll pass them. Um, we'll pass them to us. Um, so, um, while you are while you are thinking of your questions, let me um, let me start us off. Um, one of the things I'd like to ask you about um, is domestic audiences. One of the things that you've written eloquently about is the role of prestige um, when we talk about hierarchies um, with superpowers. Um, recently, you quoted an, ex quoted an exchange between uh, Kishore Mabubani and U.S. Senator Bob Corker, who basically said, and, and I'm paraphrasing, um, the day that the American people wake up and find out that they are no longer the most powerful nation on earth, this is something they are psychologically unprepared for. Um, as someone who has looked both um, at U.S. foreign policy making and Asian foreign policy making, I'd like you to think a little bit about this idea of prestige and also the fact that for prestige to work, you have to have an audience who gives you that, and the domestic audiences. What do you think both the U.S. and China fail to understand or underestimate or underestimate each other about in terms of the domestic pressures um, for superpowerhood, if you want to think about that, um, and how that has an effect on the actions or constraints that that they are dealing with. Thanks. Thank you, Tricia, for a uh, uh, most uh, you know relevant question. The role of prestige in this uh, struggle. Uh, for what I call uh, hierarchy uh, between the two top content contenders. And I think your question, you want me to uh, say something about both the domestic and the international dimension. Let me start with the domestic. I think for both the US and, the, uh, uh, and China, the importance of uh, domestic prestige uh, on the part of the, an administration with the uh, population is, of course, very, very uh, important because uh, the uh, uh, the, uh, the ability the, for the administration to uh, successfully implement its policies uh, depends in part on uh, the domestic uh, its domestic prestige. And in the U.S., I would think that uh, that prestige is associated with uh, both American power, i.e., the U.S. remaining number one in the way that Kishore talked about in his ex experience at Davos, which was in my original uh, talk, but which I had to take out because it was getting a bit long. All right, I was going to cite Kishore. Um, so the U.S. is hard for the U.S., but Cocker is the uh, uh, chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee at that point in time. So it could be that uh, for the establishment, foreign policy establish, establishment, it's more difficult to conceive of the U.S. not as number one. Now, for the typical uh, American, I'm less sure, although having lived in the States for 18 years, I would say that that comes as part of uh, America's uh, national psyche. In the case of America, I think that, uh, that uh, glowing in uh, being the number one is associated with another uh, issue, which is that uh, the US is the leader of the free world. So leader is the number one. Free world, in terms of democracy, is very, very critical. I remember taking uh, wonderful trips uh, to what we call uh, New England in the States, right? And by the time you go to New Hampshire, all right, to see the beautiful foliage, uh, you see lots of cars in New Hampshire where the car plate motto is live free or die. All right, so that's the New Hampshire state motto, and I think it reflects you know, a certain American sensibility about the importance of individual freedom and democracy, and that gives the U.S. a certain prestige, uh, you know, at least uh, as far as its domestic audience is concerned. On the part of China, uh, of course, prestige is also uh, enormously important, the prestige of the CCP and of uh, Xi Jinping and his uh, Politburo, and in that case, since uh, the emphasis is not so much on... Uh, political freedom, the emphasis on performance. All right. If all right, they deliver, and if the vast majority of Chinese citizens uh, are happy with that, then uh, they have prestige. So that's on the domestic side. 
um, now internationally, uh, what I've left out in my uh, uh, comments is that the struggle for hierarchy is also very much a struggle for prestige. That's where the soft power uh, things come into, although soft power doesn't mean very much if it is not backed up by hard power. So for most, of, most people who write about prestige, uh, it is related to hard military and economic power. Right? You have the prestige you do because when called upon, you can actually exercise that. The definition of prestige that we normally use uh, is uh, one's reputation for power or the shadow cast by power. Right? And the wonderful thing about prestige is that uh, if you have it, if the rest of the world confer it upon you because they believe in your power, they find it formidable, they won't mess around with you, uh, and, but yet they, uh, you know, they think that you're doing something good uh, for them, uh, then you, uh, it greases your diplomacy. You can get the things you want without having to use force. That's the wonderful thing about it. Because uh, in everyday international politics, force is not used very much. The things that we read about you know, in the papers, they tend to be the exceptions. The daily going-ons of international politics, where you negotiate trade agreements, where you do things, force is not mentioned. It lingers at the back of the great powers because they have that prestige, and it greases the way they deal you know, uh, with other countries. I think I'll stop there. Great. Questions? Um. Simon. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Simon Chesterman, NUS. Um, thank you for a wonderful uh, presentation um, uh, outlining a key issue for Singapore and the region. I wanted to push you a little bit on the thing that you said you weren't going to look at, which was the China side of things, which I agree is harder to describe, but you've, you've um, really painted a picture that shows how China's um, aspirations have evolved. It's sometimes said um, under Mao Zedong, China stood up, under Deng Xiaoping, China became rich, and now under uh, Xi Jinping, China is becoming strong. Um, and I wanted to ask you to reflect on something old, something recent, and something current, and how that might affect your analysis. The old thing is the fact that China is very unusual, and that what we're seeing now is a kind of re-rise. It's the second rising of a great power. And my understanding is in world history, there's never really been a comparable situation where a great power has risen, declined, and then risen again. And so how that might affect your analysis. Um, the recent thing is um, China's experience under COVID, uh, which among other things questioned the capacity of the Chinese government, but also caused it very much to turn inwards uh, and, and how that might affect. Uh, and then the recent thing is actually the front page of today's Straits Times, where there's reference to China and uh, Russia calling for a new world order, um, but that new world order is very light on specifics. Certainly there's nothing suggesting uh, a great relationship uh, in substance between China and Russia, and in particular, if there is substance, it's very much a conservative view of world order based on traditional values of the United Nations Charter, a pretty defensive notion of sovereignty, rather than any radical change in the world ordering. So something old, something recent, something new. If, if You can respond however you like, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Um, all right. Maybe I'll respond uh, to the uh, third part of your question first on the Russia-China uh, uh, unlimited friendship. Okay. So I think you are absolutely right that, uh, first of all, they seem to be moving closer together. And, and it's quite natural. I mean, uh, given the pressures uh, China feels, uh, both China and Russia, uh, are feeling in terms of uh, US-led Western response, uh, in, you know, we would expect them to draw closer to one another, to help one another out, uh, uh, at least uh, economically and uh, politically, ideologically. So that friendship or semi-alliance, we, we can see you know, uh, being tightened. All right? It's not a formal alliance yet, as they said, uh, in their meeting, but then uh, it's a different kind of cooperative uh, structure. And you're also right that actually they're very old-fashioned. I mean, uh, you know, this talk about um, having the need for a rules-based international order, the implicit assumption is almost always that, uh, you know, if it's China, we're not going to have that. 
All right. I mean, uh, some of us disagree because we think that even with China, you may have a rules-based international order, but it's just a different set of rules. All right. And what you seem to be suggesting, Simon, without putting words in your mouth, is that actually they are very pro-sovereignty, a very tight definition of sovereignty, classic uh, uh, UN stuff. Perhaps no interference in the domestic affairs of uh, you know uh, countries. So uh, in that sense. It's nothing, very, it's nothing very new. So the way I see it, the current uh, strengthening of the relations uh, between China and Russia has very much to do with uh, uh, their need to respond to the, uh, the Western uh, sanctions, you know, and uh, in China's case, uh, the new US pressures uh, in terms of competition uh, with China. On COVID, yes, I think uh, most of us have been uh, taken aback by the rapidity with uh, China reversed uh, its uh, you know, uh, COVID policy in terms of uh, lifting restrictions. And, uh, and that does raise questions about uh, the performance legitimacy, right? Although, uh, one thing I'm unclear about is uh, if we compare the number of uh, mortalities per capita, how will China do? I mean, China stopped giving those statistics uh, in December of 2022, I think. And so it's a bit murky. I would like to see some reliable stats. I think the economists mentioned maybe 1 to 1.5 million deaths. But I would like to have a more rigorous uh, sort of uh, set of figures for us to get a sense of how China performed ultimately compared to the other uh, you know, big uh, countries. So, uh, and finally, on uh, the... Uh, uh, rejuvenation or the rebirth of uh, of uh, China. Yep. The uh, uh, some time ago, I wrote an article on the American tributary system, in which I claimed that the U.S. had uh, established a more successful tributary system in the last 100 years than China. Okay. And some people have asked me now, given what China is doing today, do you see a, a return of the Chinese tributary system? Right. So this is the return of China to its glory days. Uh, in a sense, you can say that this um, interest in uh, influence and uh, wanting to be you know, the hegemon of the region resembles the old uh, interest where China was the hegemon of uh, East Asia or Asia. But the key difference is that in the past, China's claim to hegemony or uh, 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 leadership was based on its so-called civilizational greatness. It wasn't that interested. Uh, in its military uh, capability, and in fact, it focused so much on the greatness of its civilization that it neglected the military front. And when uh, you know uh, the uh, uh, imperialists came in the 1840s, China was left, uh, uh, you know, very weak. So I think this time around, I think the uh, performance legitimacy that uh, the Chinese attempt to regain its position in Asia and beyond will be based uh, you know, uh, on economics rather than on civilization, but backed up, I think, by a very strong military. Thank you. Uh, here in the middle. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, yeah. uh, Selena. Hi. Uh, thanks, Tricia. Thanks, uh, Yuan Fong. I'm Selena from uh, Lee Kuan Yew School. So this is friendly fire for um, from your own team, uh, Yun Fong. <laughs> um, so my question has to do with domestic politics of uh, both countries. Um, you know, you give a systemic view of the competition between them, but I would also argue that um, domestic politics play a large role in this competition. Um, from the Chinese side, things like Made in China 2025, uh, the BRI, there are domestic imperatives for these initiatives that are external in nature. Um, and from the US side, uh, Ryan yesterday mentioned the fractures that are in society, the ascension of Trump that leverages on this uh, fractures. Uh, may, uh, America first is as much for domestic audience as it is for um, external audience. Um, in your research, in your, um, you know, um, on this topic, uh, how do you account for domestic politics and how, I mean, in SD and PT, you know, they don't talk about domestic politics at all. So how, if you're, you're going to leave that out, how are you controlling for them? Thank you. 
ว้าวโอเคกูดนั่น very very relevant uh, question and uh, yes I think uh, in uh, Uh, in the way I think about things, I do bracket domestic politics. It's so complicated, you know. I'll let you guys deal with it later today and tomorrow. But uh, but your question is important because uh, I do agree that uh, domestic politics uh, is uh, pretty crucial. And uh, the question for me is uh, if you want to link domestic politics to the two uh, paradigms that I talked about, SD and PT, the question I think would be to ask. Does domestic politics aggravate or mitigate those dynamics? Okay, what Ryan shared with us yesterday was that given the bipartisan consensus uh, in uh, the U.S. Congress and even within uh, the U.S. Uh, you know uh, population, there seems to be a consensus that China is the new uh, threat. All right, and in that sense, when you bring in domestic politics, it aggravates the PT. And even the SD dynamic, and I think up to a point the same thing is happening uh, in China, or right? the increased uh, nationalism uh, and uh, wanting to stand up and not tolerating so-called foreign uh, interference on issues that are on core issues. So the domestic politics on both sides, it seems to me in this particular relationship, uh, tends seems to be aggravating uh, the uh, the dynamics that I've identified. I think here in the middle, there's a question. And we're uh, coming close to the end of time, so thank you. please be yeah. brief. Um, uh, my name is Mabo. I'm an associate professor from China's Nanjing University. I'm a visiting fellow here at ESS. Uh, very good to hear your speech. Uh, I have a question. I think for uh, back to a few years ago, uh, the Chinese leadership has already reached a consensus that no matter what China has done, the U.S. will always try to contain China because it's uh, uh, rising. Uh, Jin Chan Rong, a professor at uh, Renmin University of China, actually described this phenomenon as the U.S. is the expert in tearing down number two power in the world. First, the USSR and uh, Japan and now China. So he described like, yeah. So I think <laughs> for China to, uh, It finally escape a military showdown with the U.S. is to uh, surpass the U.S., uh, particularly GDP, as soon as possible. Uh, like what it has done to Japan in uh, 2009, because back to them, there are a lot of conflict between China and Japan, but after China surpassed Japan, uh, become the number two economy, things are cooling down. So I think it's uh, based on a few uh, assumptions. Uh, first, I think time is on the Chinese side, Uh, as we, the, the saying, the East is rising, the, the West is, is declining. I think the East is not just China, but mainly the global uh, source. Second, I think the, the Chinese might feel the U.S. is hesitant to launch a great power war with China for issues that it deems uh, non-extensional. Uh, maybe Taiwan or South China Sea, they think this is not the matter of death or for the U.S. Uh, uh, global power. I think third, I think China feel it can strengthen its own defense power and at the same time bring as many countries as possible to form this alignment to balance the U.S. So if those has been achieved, do you think the China-U.S. can have a peaceful or power transition? Thank you. Thank, thank you for your question. Just let me make uh, three quick points. One, uh, in terms of uh, identifying the U.S. as uh, being uh, intent and especially able to press down the number two, uh, according to the uh, PT perspective, that's what all the number one powers do. It's not just the U.S. Uh, it's Britain before the U.S., uh, it's uh, France bef uh, before the U.S. So the, the, what is uh, useful about the PT perspective is that it's, it, you know, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't care You know, the character doesn't care so much about the character of the country. Whoever is number one, all right, you will do what you can to prevent number two from overtaking you. That's the logic of international politics because uh, when you are number one, you get to call the shots, you get to uh, build things that uh, will serve you, but hopefully also serve others. The U.S. Uh, story 
is that we are not just serving ourselves as the hegemon. Look at East Asia. You know, uh, you know, uh, they have, we managed to help them grow, and they are so, uh, you know, uh, pretty happy about it, right? If you want to replace us, show that you can do better, and things of that sort. So the number one in PT view is always out to suppress the number two. So the number two can try to grow economically so much so that it surpasses the number one. But when that happens, actually, it doesn't mean that uh, peace will happen. Uh, now, the, some, people, some PT theorists assume that it is the number two that starts the conflict because the number one doesn't want uh, to give up its pole position. In some cases, it is the number one that starts the conflict. You start the conflict before all right, number two overtakes you. So, uh, so the issue is not just uh, you know, when you have economic overtake, then everything will be hunky-dory. So, but I think in these cases, a lot depends on the flashpoints. Uh, you know, uh, what are the most dangerous and core interest events that the two parties care about? And if we can set up guardrails about those, and if they can come to an understanding you know, over time. The other thing is that uh, the PT competition is a very long and drawn out one. We are not talking about the next five, six years. We are talking about the next 20, 30 years, right? So in a sense, you may be right that China has time. And uh, even back in 2015, the Pew Research Center ran a poll asking 40 people in 40 countries, do you think China will replace the US uh, as superpower? Has or will replace the US? 25 of the countries say that the US ha China has or will replace uh, the US as the superpower, 2015. Uh, survey. But then 2018, people ask the question, who would you prefer to be the world leader? All right. Uh, then you have, uh, you know, uh, the vast majority preferring the US as the world leader. So you get, you know, uh, very different views uh, around the world. Uh, and finally, uh, I'm, uh, the timing of when the US uh, begin to think that China is a systemic challenger, uh, in my uh, in my comments, I was trying to suggest that it came about uh, mainly during the Trump administration. So before that, Obama, Clinton, George W. Bush, they were all still very keen on engaging China and uh, helping it, you know, assuming that it will be playing a constructive role uh, in the international uh, arena. I think, in my view, it was the Trump administration that, uh, you know, uh, came to a different conclusion. Thank you. Um, I know that we could all spend all morning here um, talking about this, um, but unfortunately our time has come to an end. Um, I think given that this is a struggle of, as you say, you know, decades, um, hopefully we will be able to come back in the future and continue the conversation. Um, but for now, please join me in thanking Professor Kong Yuan Fung for such a... <laughs>